and everyone around you will be when we recognize there is lead me it was, it was David who said lead me to the rock that is higher than I when my heart is overwhelmed everybody say lead me lead me to the rock that is higher than I holy literally means otherwiseness God is something other than and everything beyond what we are and the fact that he is transcendent and holy and yet loves us so much is what makes the incarnation so powerful because he sent his son God up there becomes God down here. And when he walked among us, the Bible says in the message, it says, and the word was made flesh, and he moved into the neighborhood. How many know you're paying attention to who's living in your neighborhood? When you see somebody living in your neighborhood, you observe their life. And so it was a living demonstration of what God is like. I believe there was a lot of misunderstanding in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, about what God the Father was like. But Jesus came up and cleared up all the confusion. From now on, we all know. We, there's no more doubt. We know what God is like. He's like Jesus. Come on, somebody, put your hands together. Hallelujah. Would you? Are you glad to be here today? Take a second and look around and see if you see somebody you don't know. And if, and if there is somebody near you, tell them you're glad to have them here today. Introduce, give them your first name. I'm going to leave you right there. Thank you. Psalm 22, 3 says, But thou art holy, O Lord, King James says, who inhabitest the praises of Israel. And we understand from that that God who is up there literally comes and abides when we begin to, with all of our hearts, lift up worship and praise to his name. When we worship God, we are saying, God, you are worthy. Same word, worship worthy. You know, when you address a dignitary, let's just say, you, you go into a court and you address a judge. What do you call the judge? Your what? Your honor. In England, you call them your worship. So it's a, it's a Britain, uh, British idea to recognize that there's someone that is worthy of reverence, of revering, of honoring. And so when we worship God, we're saying, God, you are worthy. You are you have great value. No, no, no tongue can write, no pen can tell of the story and the, what God has done in our hearts. This morning, as we uh, wrap up this little quick three-message series called Blessed, uh, we have learned that God has empowered us to prosper. The distinction between Old Covenant blessing and new is that the Old Covenant was conditional. Jesus, I'm sorry, not Jesus, but the prophets would say, I guess it was Jesus speaking through them, but that they would say, if then, if you will do this, then I will. If you will turn to me, he says, then I will pour out my spirit upon you. I, I, I think of how many times it's the Old Testament is pregnant with statements that are conditional. If I will respond to God in a certain way, then God will do something. But the distinction between Old Covenant blessing and New Covenant blessing is that the New Covenant is past tense because there is only one in the history of humankind who's been able to fulfill all the ifs, and that is Jesus. And because we are in Christ, all the if-thens have been fulfilled. And the Scripture now says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has... Everybody say past tense who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. So every blessing now is ours. Where is it? Everybody say, in Christ. in Christ. So now it's not a matter of you got to get all your ducks in a row because there's only one who's already gotten his ducks in a row, and now we are in him. 
we have believed into Him and because we are in Christ, we identify with Him. It's not about what I do, but it's about what He's already done. Come on, somebody, put your hands together. The series text is found in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. It says, the blessing of the Lord. How many of you want some of that? Say amen. amen. The blessing of the Lord makes a person rich. And we know that's not just financial, but it's riches in every area. It's health. I mean, you can have a whole lot of money, but if you don't have any health, your money's not worth much to you. You know what? You can have a lot of money, a lot of health, but if your home life and your house and your marriage is miserable, that no matter how, how many car garage you got, no matter how many boats and, 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 and ski-doos and all that kind of stuff you have, if every time you go out it's a fuss, if every time you get in the kitchen it's just a knockdown drag out, how many of you know there's not much riches in that place? Riches is an all-encompassing idea of the peace of God in our hearts, the power of God in our spirits, the prosperity of God at our disposal, at our resources, where we are to use them for the advancement of His kingdom. Somebody say amen. amen. The blessing of the Lord makes a person rich and He adds no sorrow with it. When we walk in God's blessing, it doesn't come with the baggage of all of the consequences of bad decisions. You can be a drug dealer and get rich, but how many of you know there's a whole lot of sorrow that goes along with that? There's a lot of territory and there's a lot of gang violence, and a lot of shooting and all that kind of stuff. Whatever, you know, whatever we do that is not based on the will of God, we might be able to obtain temporarily some riches of some kind, but it's packed with all kinds of sorrow. The distinction is the blessing of the Lord makes a person rich, and He adds no sorrow to it. Put your hands together and give the Lord praise. One thing, if I could give you one concept that would sum up this little quick three-message series, then it's tied in today's one thing. Read on one of the screens or one of the walls, if you would, please. Here we go. In Christ, I have been blessed, empowered to prosper in every area of my life. That's the definition of the Bible word bless, the Hebrew word. It literally means happy, fortunate, to be envied. The blessing of God, the empowerment of for abundance to come in your life. Jesus said in John 10, I have come that you might have life and have it to the NIV says to the fullest. The King James says, have it more what? Abundantly. Abundios. It's the idea of just overflowing with the goodness and the grace and the blessing of God. Once more, read it with me. In Christ, I have been blessed empowered to prosper in every area of my life. Now, don't sit here with a religious, churchy mindset and exclude any area. Every area is every area. God wants to bless you, not just so you can have a home in heaven he, and so that you can have peace with Him and your sin debt has been paid and the power of sin has been broken, but He wants to touch your relationships. When, when, when God drops the seed of the word of the Lord inside an individual's heart, it's like a pebble that's dropped into a pond. The concentric circles just keep spreading out wider and wider and wider. And when the kingdom of God comes into an individual's life, it will eventually comprehensively touch every area. Now, the reason it doesn't in some people's lives is because they think that's not part of the gospel. That's not for me. It's just tie on the end of the rope and hang on till Jesus comes because I've got a home in heaven on a golden street somewhere, someday, some glad morning when this life is o'er. And I'm not doing away with that. I believe heaven is real. I believe hell is real. You don't want to go there. Aren't you thankful for these moderate temps that we're enjoying right now? Somebody say praise God. I saw a meme somewhere that uh, it was a crazy granny off her rocker on Instagram or something. And she says, man, i got to get my heart right with God. And the daughter says, why? She said, because it's so hot it makes me know that I can't last in hell. I don't want <laughs> to go to hell. So heaven is real. Sin is dark and bad and Jesus is Lord. And I want to tell you the devil is defeated. Somebody put your hands together and give him praise. Give God praise. In Christ I have been blessed, empowered to prosper in every area of my life. The point that I want to bring this morning as we introduce this is a particular Bible word that you really you only hear at church, but it's the principle of the tithe. 
tithe, T-I-T-H-E, and it literally very simply just means a tenth. There is nothing magical about 10%, but it's the number that God has set, and he says that if you will set aside this portion of your blessing of your income, set it apart as holy. We've sung that, we've sung that this morning. And so I want to look, first of all, to Leviticus chapter 27, uh, and it says one-tenth, that's the tithe. Uh, the, the King James says the tithe is the Lord's. The tithe is holy. The tithe belongs to God. Let me just say it this way. When you give a tithe, you're really not giving anything because it's God's already. One-tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord and must, say, read that last sentence with me, must be set apart to Him as holy. Holy means it's otherwise. It's set apart. It's not something that is reserved for you to for use for your play money or to go to the casino or, or, or whatever you, you know, whatever you choose. It's, that's not what it's for. It's God's. It is holy. It is to the Lord. Somebody says, Pastor, I can't. I can't, I can't afford to tithe. And I'll just say this to you. At, at some point in your life, you have to make a decision that you're going to honor God in your finance. Blessing starts coming when you start believing the word of the Lord and that God's word is true and you put your trust in Him. You don't put your trust in Him without taking action. You believe and then you take action. Say that with me. I believe and I take action. I counsel young couples all the time who are up to their debt, past their eyeballs with credit card debt, and just in a mess, and he got married to her, and she and he, they inherited each other's debt, and they've got all this kind of mess, and there's no way. And I just say, look, sit down and make a choice, make a decision. If it's 2%, you can't do 10, do 2. And I want you to be committed to it, because as soon as you make a commitment, I want you to know the enemy of your soul, Satan, the adversary, the, the diabolical one, Diabolos, is going to do everything he can to throw a hitch in your plan, a, a monkey wrench in your machinery, and something's going to break down and you're going to be tempted instead of giving the two that you've committed to the house of the Lord, then you're going to you know, fix the water heater or whatever. And the point is, are you going to really follow through with your commitment? You want God to follow through with his commitment, but can God trust you with what you've committed to do? When you do that, when you honor God with whatever you and your wife, your, you and your husband decide to do, I promise you, God will start to bless you and increase will come and you start to get your finances in order and it's not very often, I mean, I mean it's, 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 not, it's not uncommon is what I meant to say, that someone within a year, two years will turn around and they've already said, you know, God has blessed us so much. I've gotten a promotion. I've gotten a raise. We paid off three credit cards. And guess what? We're going to give God a raise. We're going to move it from 5% up to 8%. And usually within two or three years, they've already bumped up to 10%. What the tithe does is it demands that you actually begin to grow up an adult with your finances. And you don't just willy-nilly just blow and slide the debit card and you just, you know, run the credit card and do whatever you want to, whenever you want to. Part of the problem of our current generation is that we are influenced so much by the demand of self-gratification when our parents knew how to put things on hold and save and then pay cash for it. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching so good right now. I remember my father-in-law, before he passed, told me one time, he said, Mike, I'm going to tell you, he said, Gene's hitting so many of these sales, I'm saving so much money, I can't afford it. <laughs> How many of you know, just because there's a one-day sale at Macy's doesn't mean you've got, you got a closet full of clothes already. Now, don't let me pick on the ladies, because, you know, you guys, you know, you, 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 you've been looking at a pair, a set of golf clubs or a new shotgun at Bass Pro Shop. Well, there's a sale on. Well, I, I can save $300. Well, if you don't have the seven to go with it, then you're in trouble. <laughs> all right, look at Malachi chapter 3. Malachi 3 says, bring all the tithe. Everybody say all. Now, eventually you want to take a step where you're obeying this principle and when you start to do that, it's amazing how God will, look what it says he'll do. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. Leave it right there. Don't move on yet. Go back. Bring all. Everybody say all. all. 
That doesn't mean you give a little bit here to the church and a little bit to this ministry and a little bit to that ministry. It says bring all the tithe into the storehouse. What's the storehouse? The storehouse is your local place where your need gets met. Now let me tell you something. A lot of wonderful ministries, and I, I, I'm not going to throw off on anybody, but whatever brother or sister that you feel like you need to send your tithe to, remember she ain't going to come to the hospital when you need somebody to visit you and pray for you. The storehouse. The storehouse is where folk come and they're in a difficult situation and their house burns down and everybody in here gathers up clothes and we take a collection and we go and minister to those needs and we make sure that folk lights stay on and we make sure that people have got some food in the refrigerator and that babies are not in that house going hungry and there's some diapers to cover those little bottoms and there's some formula to go in those mouths. That's the storehouse. You bring all the tithe into the storehouse. Everybody say all the tithe into the storehouse and he says so there will be enough food in my temple now let's move on it says if you do says the Lord of heaven's armies I will open the windows of heaven for you I will pour out a blessing everybody say so great so great you won't have enough room to take it in try it this is one of two places in the Bible where God says I dare you read the last sentence with me put me to the test now that's the issue some of you have never put God to the test now let me just say this to you don't don't write your tithe check this week and by Friday expect a fifty thousand dollar miracle you gotta sow some seed you gotta put some seed in the ground you hadn't been given anything you gotta sow some seed you gotta sow some seed consistently and I want you to remember this there's not a seed you plant that you reap the fruit of that seed in the same season you plant it in you sow in one season, you reap in another. That's why if you, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 11, if we keep on casting our bread upon the water, it will come back to us on every wave. So you've got to keep on casting. You've got to keep on sowing. You've got to keep on planting the seed. You've got to keep on obeying the principle of God's word, the principle of the tithe. And this is what he says that I will do. He says, now notice this. When I'm walking with God and obeying this principle, and this was how I was taught growing up, we paid our tithes. We didn't give our tithes. How many of you, how many of you relate to that? Yeah. Come on, raise your hand. If you, if you remember hearing folk talk about paying your tithe, because tithes belong to God. He says, your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Now, in this passage, in the whole third chapter of Malachi, the prophet is saying, will a man rob God? And the priest said, how have we robbed God? He says, you've robbed me in your tithes and offerings. And it was because he said, when you bring the animals before the Lord, every tenth animal that passes under the rod is supposed to be holy to the Lord and sacrifice to God. But what they were doing was they would line their sheep up so that every tenth one was one of the weakest animals of the flock. Now, how many of you know when you give God the weakest, the least and the last and the lost, and you go, well, you know, God, did, I, God doesn't need, really need anything anyway, and so I'm going to keep the best for myself. Now, it was literally supposed to be by chance, just whatever comes through, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Actually, it was the first of the first fruits. It was the very first one. So you bring that one, and then the 11th one, and then the 21st one are all supposed to be holy to the Lord. And he says, you know, you're putting these, these sickly, blind in one eye, three-legged sheep, <laughs> and you're giving them to the Lord and saying, praise the Lord for the tithe that we give to God. And God don't want our sickly sheep. God doesn't want what's left over because there's no action in that and there's no faith in that there's no trust in that but when I say God I trust you and this is what happens when I tithe I'm saying God I believe that when I give you the tenth the best the first fruits of my my blessing and everything that I have produced then you put your supernatural blessing on the 90%. And I believe that because your blessing is on the 90, I can stretch that farther than I can to try to manage the 100 by myself without your blessing. And so this is the principle. He says, I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have room enough to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fail from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Put me to the test. 
God says, I dare you. I believe that tithing is what opens the windows of heaven. He says, if you will do this, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out upon you a blessing you've not even had room enough to receive. Now, somebody says, but the tithe was only under the law. And there are folk who claim to be New Testament Christians and who use this as an excuse to say, well, I don't have to give a tithe. I'm not obligated to God. And, and I'll be honest with you, there's some disagreement on this. But I want you to know that 400 years before the law was ever given, Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek of the spoils of the battle that he had just been in. In the Garden of Eden, every tree was available to uh, Adam and Eve, except there was one that was marked as holy to the Lord. It is the Lord's, don't touch it, don't, don't, don't have, don't, it's not yours. He didn't say don't touch it, but he said don't eat the fruit. He said this one is mine. That was the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And throughout the whole scripture, Jesus says to the Pharisees, he says, you know, you tithe on your mint and your uh, anise and your cumin. I don't know if that's the way you say it, anise or anise. It is the, uh, uh, an herb. He said, you, you know, you're out here, you're, you're splitting hairs, giving leaves off of a little plant, but yet I would rather that you would, would give the tithe of love and justice and mercy, he says. So Jesus is not doing away with the tithe and the old covenant as he brings in the new he says no more so let it be a tithe from the heart that we give the things that are true the things that are necessary love and forgiveness and the the righteousness the justice of God somebody say amen in Christ I have been blessed empowered to prosper in every area of my life the scripture calls us stewards the principle of stewardship is that God has entrusted us with something for a season. It actually does not belong to me, but I am managing it for God. That's man's position on the earth. We are to steward the earth. We're to steward and manage the resources on this planet. Your children are not actually yours. They are the Lord's, but you have been given the charge to steward their lives, to build his and her soul, to guard them from the onslaught of all of the ideology, ideological demonism that is surrounding them that sometimes you're allowing to be pumped into your own house over various means of media. And you know, we're not going to demonize the television or social media, but keep your finger on the pulse of what your attention, your children are paying to. Let me just say this to you, just so you, just because just you're an adult doesn't mean you should just let everything wash over you. Pay attention to what goes in your heart. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. What goes in? Garbage in, what is the thing? Garbage out. You put in good things, then out of your mouth is going to flow good things, out of your heart. I want you to recognize in Matthew 25, Jesus gives the parable. It's a natural story with a spiritual lesson. He gives the parable of the talents. One man according to his abilities, the scripture says. I'm not going to take time to read this extensive passage because it's Matthew 25, 14 through 30. But the Bible says there were three men as a, an owner left to go and travel to a, a far off place, to a foreign country. And he gives three men according each to his own abilities. One five talents, one two talents, one one talent. Now, that's not singing and organizational skills and landscaping and painting and hunting. It's not those kinds of talents. This word in the Bible is a financial term. It is a weight of gold. A talent is a certain amount of money. And so one man was given one talent, one man was given two, one man was given five talents. First of all, let me just help you understand that God is just, God is not fair. I, I didn't get a whole lot of amens on that. But if you think that of this American idea where everybody's got to be guaranteed the exact same thing all the time, every time, you all weren't born into the same socioeconomic status. Some families had a lot. Some families had nothing. My grandparents lived in a shack in Mark Tree, Arkansas. Mama was born in the back room of a shotgun shack. And, 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 and literally in three generations, God has exponentially brought increase and blessing when my parents left 
and came to West Memphis so my dad would work for Crittenden Implement Company. He became a John Deere tractor mechanic for $52 a week in 1951 when they left Truman, Arkansas and moved here. And my granny and Mark Tree thought that they were moving to the other side of the nation because it was 31 miles. Oh, I'll never see you again. And we were over there every Sunday, every Sunday after church. And, I, you know, I think about how, how absolutely abject poverty that my, my folks came in. My mother quit school in the sixth grade and married my dad. She was 14, he was 25. My grandfather had to go to Harrisburg, Arkansas and sign a piece of paper so Mary Agnes could marry Grady. Grady showed up at the Church of God on Allen Street in Mark Tree, Arkansas, and he, he said, uh, Deacon Blake, I'd like to court your daughter. And he said, that's great. You can every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. She'll be right here on this pew. We'll see you in church. And I've seen pictures of my mom in those old sepia tone, the black and white, and she was really a very, very beautiful young girl, beautiful woman. And and Dad was quite a handsome guy, a young GI, young private in the Army, got drafted and actually went in, in um, not drafted, but volunteered and went in. Maybe you later was drafted. I don't remember what the whole story is. But was part of the World War II, the first invasion in Normandy. And just amazing stories. I literally a whole shadow box full of medals that have medals of valor and honor and all of this. And literally in the next generation, it just exploded. And then they had four children. And we sat at the dinner table all the time and we heard how we need to uh, honor God and how we need to, we need to trust God and, and love His Word and we need to uh, get an education. That was the thing that they always emphasized because my dad never got more than a third grade education. Literally, born one of 12 children in Savannah, Tennessee, and, and he was born in 1914. So he was of age when the Great Depression was going on, and they lost their family 160-acre farm and moved to Taranza, Arkansas, and sharecropped on the Norcross Plantation. Some of you are familiar with some of these old names, especially some of the older saints here in the house. And so they grew up, and Daddy was at Taranza, and Mom, and Mom was at Mark Tree, and he goes and shows up at the church, and they get married. And so, because mom never got more than a sixth grade education and dad more than a third grade education, every meal they talked about trusting God and working hard and never quitting. And it wasn't always in that order. That's kind of the way I put it together of years of memory. And it was an emphasis on one of those. And we'd, we would sit down every night at the dinner table and we would talk about things. And how was your day at school? And they would always bring things back around to you know, a, a place of wisdom on what the Word of God said. And so because of recognizing that, they knew that they were stewarding our lives and building into our souls. And, and we had conversations about important things. And, and we were corrected in a gentle, but yet a loving, but a firm kind of way. All of these stewards who were given five and two and one talent, they did different things with them. And what I've, the reason I talk to you for a moment about my own family is because each generation has exponentially exploded beyond the last one. Right. Me and Dawn above what my mom and dad had. My two children way above anything that Dawn and I ever had. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful because of the time that we had building into them and stewarding them. And, 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 and Drew calls me at least two or three times a week and says, Des, what do you think about this? I'm trying to scale this business. And... And literally in three years, he's built a multi-million dollar business. He's been three times, if guys have been offered him in serious numbers, trying to, so we'll buy your company from you because of what you've already built. And, and you all got, all of you know what's going on with Abby. And so it's just, it's, and, and they'll call and say, Dad, I have this opportunity. What do you think about it? And I will say, well, what, let me pray about it. What do you think? And so we're always talking back and forth about the next decision, taking things to the next level. And when... The, I want you to realize that they, from a little bitty young age, recognized, I said, the blessing of the Lord is on your life. God's blessing, His hand of blessing is on your life. And when you put Him first, and when you do that, then you can lean into and believe in Him and then take action in confidence when those kinds of things arise. 
Every one of those three stewards were given talents to manage according to their individual abilities. Everybody in this room is not the same. Some of you have skill sets. Some of you were born into money. Some of you have made it hard, the hard way because you're not afraid to work. And, and the whole point is, this is what I want you to realize. And this is hard to say, but I want you to recognize that when God gave one man five and one man two and one man one, and the Bible says, according to their abilities, how do I apply that to my life? That means that right now I have as much as God can trust me with. Am I being faithful with what I have been given? Some of you would really like to get a new car, but you're not cleaning the one you got. It's kind of quiet in here. Some of you want a new and a bigger house, but I mean, it's falling down where you live right now. You, you slap a fresh coat of paint on it, fix that piece of trim. That, 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 that squeaky door, you know, a little, little, little shot of WD-40, it's amazing how far that'll go. It's like it's got the Holy Ghost in it. <laughs> there came a day of, of accountability where what God had entrusted to those three stewards had to open the books and say what they did with it. And so the one who had had five had taken that five and literally earned another five and he had ten. The one who had taken the two had taken it and had, had doubled his as well. And the one who was given the one dug a hole in the ground, wrapped the talent in a, in a napkin, and he buried it. And the owner was furious. He said, why, I should have taken this and deposited it at the bank because I could have at least gotten interest on it. There's a risk. You've got to step out in faith when you are... When you are doing something in an entrepreneurial, you're starting a business, you're trusting God, you're making decisions on a daily basis, and, and sometimes they're good ones and sometimes they're bad ones. It's like the, 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 the very, very successful banker was asked one time, how did you become successful? He said, by making right decisions. And he says, well, how did you know how to make right decisions? He says, by making some wrong ones. Failure is a part of the process. Do not, because you miss it one time. Beat yourself up and quit. Everybody say, trust God, trust God. work hard, God. never quit. Because what, listen, if you don't quit, it's not a failure because you got a lesson out of it. If at first you don't succeed, what did, I, what did Benjamin Franklin tell us? If at first you don't succeed? That's the secular way of, of saying that what you reap is based on what you've sown. What you sow is what you reap, okay? So this is a day of accountability. And the Bible says if we are faithful in the little things that he will make us a ruler over what? Much. Okay. So be faithful with what you've got. I remember when my son um, was probably eight, nine years old and he wanted a leather basketball because some of his friends had a leather basketball. And I said, well, hey, that's great. Where's, where's the rubber one that we bought at Walmart? It's outside in the yard getting rained on. I said, I tell you what, you show me you can take care of that one, then I'll, I'll spend 50, 60, whatever, 70 bucks, whatever it was for a good leather basketball back then. And so the whole point is, how can I expect God to make me ruler over more when I've not been faithful with what's in my hand right now? Come on, somebody. Are you getting anything out of this? In Christ, I have been blessed, empowered to prosper in every area of my life. Now, the issue is, is that when we come to Christ, many times we're so excited at first because every prayer we pray gets answered. Anybody remember those days when you, when you first met the Lord, you first were saved, you water baptized, you filled with the Holy Spirit, and man, you're praying prayers, and it's just like every time you turn around, it's blowing you away. And it seems like then something happened, and you thought that you had grown distant from God, and that's not really the case. It's this God is growing you up. Every day is not God raining manna down on your lawn. If you keep living like that, you're living in a wilderness mentality when God's desire was to use the wilderness as a school to prepare a generation to go and inherit the great things of God in a land that they could call their own, in a land described as flowing with milk and honey, a land with copper in the hills, and that was foreign to them because you got to mine that copper. you got to go dig it out of those hills. 
They were used to every morning getting up and walking out there and their Egg McMuffin was laying on the lawn. Their McDLT or whatever it was. They've got this stuff called manna. You know what? We, we have misinterpreted. Manna does not mean bread. Manna is a question in the Hebrew. Literally, it's what is it? It's, 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 a, it's an awestruck look of what in the world is going on. Every morning they went out there, manna. God provided. God dumped it on them. I remember when Drew was a little boy and he, he loved sweet tea because he was raised in my house. And we would fix the glass and put it on the table so that he would have it along with his meal. And then he got to be a little bit older. We said, you know, you can fix your own. There's, just push the button, the ice comes out, and just pour it out of the thing, out of the, out of the container, out of the carafe or whatever it is. And then there came a time when we said, look, you're a teenager. You've got you to gotta realize that you don't just open that refrigerator door and tea appears. Somebody has to make that tea. This is how you make tea, son. And so in various stages of his life, it was handed to him by somebody else. He learned how to get the glass and pour it in there. Then he learned that somebody had prepared it, and he learned how to make some tea. And then he learned somebody had to go to the store and buy the tea. They had to work a job. And so there are levels of understanding that God takes us through. And it's not always every day of my life looking out on the lawn and the day's needs are, are poured out out there for me. The scripture says in Joshua chapter 5 verse 12, listen. No manna appeared on the day they first ate from the crops of the land and it was never seen again. Everybody say, no manna. It says, so from that time on the Israelites ate from the crops. Everybody say crops. Ate from the crops of Canaan. Now, if there's a crop, guess what that means? Come on, put it up there. That's your cue. Click. There you go. If there's a crop, what does that mean? Somebody planted some seeds. Somebody got some seeds. They didn't eat up all their seeds. What was the lesson last week? And that is that God provides seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. And we learned don't eat all your seed. Get some seed and save it to put in the ground. Set aside a portion. Pastor, I can't do ten like I told you. D do two. Decide two. Decide five. Decide seven. Whatever. But trust God and then follow through with your commitment. And then God starts to pour out blessing and then you're able to bring increase. And I had somebody tell me one time, Pastor, I've got a raise. I'm going to give God a raise. I said, that sounds like a great idea. Well, Pastor, you're just teaching this because you, you need to pay the building payment. You need to raise some funds. Yeah, honest to God, I'm going to tell you the slap truth. Yes, it costs some money to advance the kingdom of God. We don't come in here and turn the lights on for free. All the stuff that we do. When, when we give out turkeys at Thanksgiving, when we put brand new coats on kids' backs at Christmas, when we reach out to this community, when we pay a family's light bill, when we do all the things that we do in this church, it doesn't just happen. I can't take your faith to the bank. I have to have some dollars and I have to deposit them in the bank. When there's a crop, it means there's an opportunity and an opportunity is a blessing that requires work. Some folk don't have any blessing because they're afraid to work. Thomas Edison said this, folk miss out on opportunity because when it comes, it knocks on the door dressed in overalls and it looks like work. Opportunity is going to cost you some time and some talent and some treasure. If you build anything great in your family, if you build a legacy, it's because you're going to work. You're going to trust God and work hard and never quit. Put your hands together and give the Lord praise. One thing, in Christ I have been blessed, past tense, empowered to prosper in every area of my life. Last point. Have you got anything out of this this morning? Last point, I'm finished. Nothing reveals my heart like my money. Nothing reveals my heart like my money. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of it is. And you don't have to have any of it to love it. You, you can be, as my granddaddy used to say, poor as Job's turkey. Now, I think that's probably pretty poor. You can be poor as Job's turkey and not have any money, but have the love of it. It's interesting. When you, when you study Old Testament geometria, it's where there is a number 
ascribed to every one of the Hebrew letters. In the Greek, it's the same. When you look at the word wealth and you add up, like A is 1 and B is 2 and C is 3 and D is 4, you add up the numerical value of wealth, it adds up to be 666. Now everybody's really interested now. Ooh, that's the mark of the beast. Oh, ooh. The money that's in your pocket can have a, a beast mark on it, or it can have the mark of Christ on it. And it all depends on how you handle your money. Interestingly enough, there's another word that we revere that also adds up to be 666, and that's the word tradition. When you worship your traditions... So Jesus said, your traditions make the word of God of no effect. And I, I want you to recognize that traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. But godly tradition is the living faith of the dead. There are good traditions. Come on. Now, there's good wealth. Just because wealth is dangerous doesn't mean that we just push it all aside and go, oh, well, I'm just going to be poor to the glory of God. That was the attitude in the church that my folks were raised in. They used to say, Lord, we'll keep him poor if you'll keep him humble. Talking about the preacher. That's what they'd say. We'll keep him poor if you'll keep him humble. Keep him full of the Holy Spirit. We'll, keep, we'll make sure he's poor, Lord, because they thought that riches were a curse. And that mindset totally eliminated the possibility of a whole generation of people walking in greater blessing because what they believed about money. Now, I want you to see, cars are dangerous. But you all still drove here in one this morning, didn't you? Because when you obey laws and you are careful, when you do the right thing, you can use something that has power that is dangerous when you use it improperly, but it can bless you when you use it the right way. Come on, somebody. Same with wealth. Same with wealth. God wants to bless you. He wants to make you a channel, a funnel, where greater resources can flow through you. But if you're a closed-hand, stingy giver and not an open-handed, generous-hearted person, then it, we have a tendency to become our own dead sea. It just all sort of piles up and we hang on to it and there's no flow. And life can't live in that. I've been to the Dead Sea in Israel. I have floated in it. Your big backside floated? Yes, sir. It's crazy because the salt content is so high. And it's the coolest thing. You just, there's no sinking. You just float. And I want you to know God doesn't want us to be a Dead Sea. He wants to be a river that's flowing, that has life in it. They're, they're, it's a stream. There are trees that are growing with fruit on them. And their leaves don't wither and they bear fruit in due season. And whatever they do prospers. That's the blessed man. That's the blessed woman. Somebody say, that's me. Luke 12, 34 says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now notice it didn't say where your heart is, there's where your money is. I want you to know that you can get a real good indication of where your heart is by just looking at your checkbook and seeing what you spend your money on. And you know, nothing, I'm not throwing off on anybody, there's nothing wrong with golf clubs and shotguns and hunting clubs and boats and, and lake trips and travel and all that. I think all those are wonderful things to enjoy so long as we have a sense of priority of how God has called us to set apart what is holy to Him first. Come on, somebody. You know, the one thing that Jesus said you cannot serve God and, what was it? God and mammon. He didn't say you can't serve God and power. Would to God Washington understood that, even the religious right folk. This is a power grab. He didn't say you can't serve God and sex. These things are obvious. He said you cannot serve God and mammon. Why did he say you can't serve God and mammon? Because the deceitfulness of wealth. It will lure you, it will con you, it will make you think that you can. 
and the love of it begins to wrap its tentacles around us. You cannot serve God and mammon. And let me tell you what, what giving generously does, it breaks the bondage of materialism in our 21st century off of me as a believer where I say, God, I put you first and I will be generous knowing that you've given me everything I do have and as you multiply it and bless it, you will give me more so I can be a blessing to somebody else. Put your hands together and give the Lord praise. I'm finished. What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your money? Those are the two things. Some folk have more time than others. Some folk have more money than others. And it's not about fairness. It's about justice. It's about according to our abilities. What are we doing with what we've got? We can sit around and complain about what we don't have. But when we wake up and honor God by taking care of what we do have and letting generosity flow through us, it's amazing how He will make us to be ruler over more than what we've had in the past. Somebody say amen. amen. Dr. Billy Graham said this. He said, you want to show me your heart as a Christian, show me your calendar and your checkbook. What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your money? Because that's a real indicator. Are you, are you showing up at the house of God and worshiping with an atti right attitude and serving in some capacity? Are you, are you helping a team that's in need? Are you ministering to someone in the community that's, that's desperate for uh, some food? I, you know, I know there's all kind of homeless folk all around. I don't give to every one of them, but I have learned to listen to the still, small voice of the Spirit and say, help this one. And I did the other day. I had a $5 bill in my pocket. It was the last one that I had. And, and a lady came up, literally, with children. And you know what? She may have been kind of me, but that's between her and God. And I said, here. Take this, here's a five. And, and not, that's just five bucks, it's nothing. I'm, I'm not trying to put any praise on me. I'm just saying that there was a time that I wouldn't do that because I was so hard right in my politics that I always, you know, Paul says, if you don't work, you don't eat. Well, you know, some folks ain't working because they can't find a job. Jobs to be had. Some folks are not working because they ain't looking for a job. I understand that. But every situation is not the same. And when you start judging somebody, thinking they're all the same, you are walking in a spirit of prejudice. You're prejudging them and don't know their story. Everybody around you in this room has got a story. Somebody in this room is hurting. We need to reach out and love the people that are around us and the folk that come in that are new. Some of them have come from such church hurts. Some of them have come from such brokenness because of a bad experience and a set of circumstances, some over which they may have had some control and some which they didn't. And people can be nasty. And church people, my God help me, can be mean. Help us, Lord, be filled with the love of the Holy Spirit in this place. So, so that we can actually live out what they taught us to sing in Sunday school in our five-year-old class, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in His sight. Put your hands together and give the Lord praise. Help us, Lord. Stand to your feet with me this morning, if you would, please. In Christ, I have been blessed, empowered to prosper in every area of my life. Heads bowed, eyes closed, lights are down, nobody's looking around.